So I see that some people are joining by phone. I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see the slideshow if you're using your phone. So um, if you'd like to quickly download Zoom on either computer, um, it would probably be more helpful to see the PowerPoint itself. Um, if you also don't have the ability to do that right now, uh, we will be um, able to provide you with the resources and the PowerPoint later um, on a Google Drive. So you'll be able to access it later if you just want to um, listen for now. Okay, cool. So why don't we go ahead and get started and um, Jane and I can continue to uh, let people in as they come. All right, hi everyone. We're so happy to see everyone here and we wanna thank everyone for coming first of all. Uh, we're really excited to get our webinar started, but before we continue into the transition into university portion of our webinar, I wanna welcome Nagar, who is the voice that you've been hearing, who is our Horizons coordinator uh, for this year to give us a brief message on what Horizons is and what our student union is. Sorry, I was trying to see if I was muted. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I can quickly just go over what um, the MSU is. So the MSU is stands for the McMaster Student Union. Um, it's a student organization that represents over 24,000 yeah, 24, students. Um, it's comprised of all undergrad students enrolled in 18 units or more. So if you're a full-time student, um, the MSU already represents you and you're part of it. Uh, the MSU runs over 36 business units and services to help stand, enhance student life. Um, and Horizons is one of those services. Um, and I'll have Jane explain a little bit more about what Horizons is usually typically um, and what it has changed to, I guess, this year. Um, so Horizons is a three day and two night leadership conference that happens every summer um, for the past 18 or 19 years, I believe. And this year, unfortunately, because of um, the evolving situation with COVID-19, we're unable to have an in-person conference, and instead we're doing virtual um, virtual um, webinars. webinars and resources and different programming that we'll be doing um, to help you guys with your transition to university. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, it's for first years to develop lifelong leadership skills. There are sessions and events um, which lay a foundation for leadership and academic excellence. These sessions, we are doing a modified version um, virtually, so you'll still be able to access that content. Um, but yeah, this year it's going to be online. Um, but hopefully in the next year, it's something that you can get involved in as a upper year student and as, as a leader. Um, just to add on to that, um, the sessions are basically hosted on our Instagram. Um, so if you follow us, um, which will like at MSU underscore horizons, they'll be posted weekly and they're kind of like little activities you can do at home by yourself, just considering the times we're in right now. Um, and there'll be diff different interactive activities that we can ask you to participate in um, via Instagram. So just make sure you're on a watch for those. Thank you to Nagar and Jane for that message. So now it's finally time to get started with our webinar. Uh, just a quick introduction to the format of our webinar and what our plan for them is. So the webinars will take place each Thursday at the same time, which is 6 p.m. Um, each of them will feature a unique topic. Uh, this week's is obviously uh, transition to university. Next week's is gonna be student life. And each week after that, we'll feature uh, new guest speakers that have expertise in that area. So you may have seen from our Instagram that we asked you all to submit some questions. So today we will be featuring some of those questions that we received from first years um, on the initial transition to university. And throughout the course of the webinar, uh, you might think of new additional questions that you have. So please uh, directly uh, message them to Sophia and then we can get those and the rest of our panelists as well as us can answer them for you. So now moving on to our team. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. My name is uh, Ganit Sandhu. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm in my fourth year of health sciences, and I'm going to be one of the moderators of this webinar today. And my name is Sophia. My pronouns are also she, her. I'm going into my third year of health sciences at Mac, and I'm your other moderator. So remember, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, we'll have a Q&A period at the end. We just ask that you message me specifically over the chat function and I will try to bring up as many as possible near the end of the webinar.
Okay, hi, my name is Nagar. My pronouns are she, her. I'm going into my fourth year of chemical biology and I will be one of the administrators. So I'll just be doing a lot of the back work for Zoom. Um, so if you're having any technical difficulties, feel free to uh, private message me via the chat function. Uh, my name is Jane Jomi. My pronouns are she, her. I'm going into my last year of health sciences and I'm also one of the administrators. So again, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can contact me as well. So now moving on to our panel guests, we will get each guest to introduce themselves. Um, each one does play a different role on campus. They're in different programs and they have different experiences. So we do have a great range of backgrounds to choose from to answer all of your questions. So after everyone introduces themselves, we'll jump right into the questions and then we'll follow that up with the Q&A portion. Hi everyone, my name is Hiba Shahid. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm going into my fourth year of health sciences as well. Um, I have had the pleasure of being involved in a lot of different activities on campus. Um, for example, I was a community advisor last year um, and this is pretty much like a Don who lives with you uh, in residence to help support you. Uh, that's gonna be looking a little bit different this year. Um, I am also first year council coordinator this year and first year council um, is an MSU service it's a group of first year students elected by their peers in the fall who serve to represent and advocate for the distinct needs of first year students um, at McMaster University. So this is a great way for all of you to get involved if that's something that you're interested in. Um, I'm also president of Smiling Over Sickness this fall, um, which is an organization that works to promote uh, local um, local areas such as the Ronald McDonald House, the McMaster Children's Hospital. Um, I was also part of MSU Spark last year and in my free time I love to paint, bake, and cook. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah, Sarah Tangidi. I use she, her pronouns and I'm going into my fourth year of honors um, life sciences. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about myself. So this incoming year, I am the, di uh, the diversity services director um, and diversity services is basically um, the anti-racism network and service here in the MSU and, and on campus. So it serves to um, cater programming and events to BIPOC students. BIPOC just means students who are black, indigenous, or people of color. Um, I have also, I am also currently a resident orientation advisor, or as we like to acronym it, AROA. So uh, we are planning um, events and programming virtually for students who are incoming um, and wanting to sort of transition. You might have heard of something called Archway. I'm pretty much involved with helping plan that. Um, I am also a campus tour guide or used to be a campus tour guide. Um, currently campus tours are virtual. Some of you may have experienced them. Um, and I like to embroider on my free time. I love my dog and I love to cook. Hi everyone, um, my name is Bela and my pronouns are she and her. I'm going to my fourth year of social psychology and I'm doing a double minor in both psychology and sociology. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, for this upcoming year, I'm the MSU SPARK coordinator. So SPARK is an MSU service, just like Horizons and Diversity Services and First Year Council. Um, and we run through different pillars. So we have sessions, events, and online resources that are all designed to help ease the transition into first year. Um, so right now we're working on that programming for the upcoming year, which is super exciting. Um, I'm also with Sarah, a residence orientation advisor. So working on planning Archway um, and that online programming right now. Um, in the past years, I've been involved with Mac Dance, which is the recreational dance team on campus. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. And I really enjoy baking and watching dog videos because I don't have one of my own. So now that we've met all the panelists, we'll jump straight into the question portion. So one of our most common questions that we get from first years is how should they build, this, build their schedule and what should they keep in mind when making their schedule? So for this question, we'll have Hiba answer it. All right, so making your schedule. Um, so this is, I feel like, a very big concern that I had when um, transitioning into university. Um, you go from having I, I, like four courses in high school to like five courses and then you know building your schedule like how do you go about all of that it was definitely very confusing um, what you see on the screen over here is called my timetable and this is something that's available to you on mosaic which is um, 
uh, where you're going to be able to build your schedule um, and enroll in all your courses. And that's going to be available to you probably a little bit later in um, June and um, enrollment dates, which is when you're going to know about um, when you are able to make your schedule, you'll find out about all of that stuff later on as well. Um, but some tips that I would recommend when making your schedule would involve trying to balance the workload in your semester. For example, if you know that for your program, you have to take um, two biology courses and maybe trying to take one in each semester. Um, I'd also recommend being honest with yourself. So if, for example, you know that you're not a morning person and you can't make better eat 30, don't take that 830. Um, as much as we'd like to think, oh, like I'd love to have the schedule and follow this, you have to be real with yourself and what you're going to follow. Um, I'd also recommend taking courses that you're interested in. Um, they are often the courses that you will probably do the best in. Sometimes people, you know, want to take maybe an easier course or a lighter course, but it ends up um, going the other way and it's a lot more difficult. So definitely take courses that you're interested in. Um, also build your schedule in a way that gives you time to study um, and gives you useful time. So for example, for myself, I found in first year, hour gaps didn't really work for me. Um, I wasn't very productive. So maybe keep that in mind. Can you be productive, especially if the fall semester is online? Um, are you going to be able to be productive during that time or do you maybe need a longer gap to study? Um, and yeah, those are just some kind of tips that I would uh, recommend. And also something that you can do is um, look at uh, your program requirements in advance um, to see what courses uh, you need to take for the upcoming year. Does anyone else have any other thoughts before I move on in building the schedule? I was just gonna add um, that when you're building your schedule, also keep in mind since it seems like some things or most things are gonna be online, um, think about how many hours a day you're, ha you're gonna have to be on your laptop or on your device. Um, Cause Zoom fatigue or just like being on the, looking at your screen for too long can cause you to become tired and not really motivate you to study after your classes are done. So just another thing um, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And another small tip about my timetable is that there you can actually put in a preference for what time of day you want your classes to be. So whether you like uh, morning classes, midday or evening, if you put that preference in, when you search up for classes, it'll show you those classes first. So it's a lot easier to build it according to your personal um, needs or preferences. Um, I was just going to add about kind of your enrollment dates. So how it works with math is, well, this year, usually enrollment happens in June, but obviously due to current situation, enrollment has been pushed to July. Uh, but how you enroll is through Mosaic, which is a website that Mac uses where you'll be able to like pay your tuition, pick your courses. Um, but something to keep in mind is Mac does like individualized enrollment. So you randomly get a specific time that you'll be able to go on Mosaic and enroll. Um, and that's kind of done through a lottery system. So. I would say make sure that you have backup courses um, just in case you don't get into the course that you want, especially with first year courses, they tend to fill up super quickly um, and you definitely don't have uh, power over like when you get your enrollment date. Some years it might be super early and some years it might be super late. Um, so I would just say make sure you have backup options for courses um, that you might also be interested in taking. Also, um, along the my timetable lines, something I didn't know in first year is if I'll try to like move my cursor over it so y'all can see. Um, but this section right here, the generated results, essentially when you pick a course, sometimes there's more than one specific time that it runs. So my, my timetable will generate every single like possible timetable you can have um, with the courses you've picked. So definitely flip through them and see if there's some that work better than others for you. Um, sorry, just one thing to add is that your request. So basically what Sophia said is like there's different cores that you can take at different times. Um, but basically, if you're required, if you have a required course for your program, those won't like fill up like you'll be able to get a spot if you're in that program. It's only if like I'm not in business and trying to take an econ course, then those reserved seats will be for uh, business students first. So it'll make sure that all the students that require that to graduate or require that for next um, for like upper year courses will get those first um, before other students can enroll in it. Also keep in mind that once the school year actually begins, you'll have a couple of weeks for you to change your schedule. So if you find that um, if you took an elective, for example, and you don't particularly like it, or um, you chose a certain class time and doesn't work for you, you can always change the class time given that class is still available and choose a different course. 
Yeah, to add on to that, I feel like that's a pretty big point. Like when I um, came into university, I thought like, okay, this is my schedule. Like I have to follow this, but it's very flexible. You can um, take a course, maybe try it out for a little bit. And um, as long as you change it before the ad drop date, like there's no problem at all. So definitely don't, you know, take whatever you have in stone. You can totally change it. If that's it, I guess we'll move on to the next topic. So given COVID and that this fall, um, all of our courses will be done online, another common question that we have is, how can I make friends through these online pl platforms? Um, I think that's a really good question. It's definitely a concern that I had uh, going into my first year and my, and my uh, first year wasn't online, right? So um, I would really suggest that you look up on whatever platform that you kind of work best with, whether it's Instagram, it's Facebook, or if you do it through the Archway program, um, to look up some groups that you're uh, that you might have interest with. So whether that is someone, whether that is like a faculty group. So say you're in the Health Sciences program, you sort of join the Faculty of Health Sciences Facebook group, and you engage with incoming health sides like that. Um, or if you, I've seen Instagram groups for different um, sort of like hobbies and interests pop up. So whatever the case is, I'm sure there will be someone who is interested in the same thing that you're interested in. So um, I would really suggest groups. The other is if you see someone online, maybe through Archway that you see like, oh, maybe I have common interest, reach out, send them a message. You never know who could be on the receiving end. It could be your best friend. Um, and then it could also be just someone that you chat with with a little bit and then you don't hit it off and you move on. Uh, another can be clubs. So at Mac, we have over 300 clubs. That's a lot of clubs. There's probably a club out there for you that has exactly what you're looking for, a very niche interest that you might have and there's people who might share it. And if not, you can always start one. Um, so these are all different options for ways to sort of meet people who are um, similar to you, who have a similar background um, and that you can become friends with. I want to add on to that. Um, so given that you're going to have classes online, it can be kind of hard through like even lectures or tutorials to get to know people if obviously you're learning in class. So if you do um, come into those uh, class group chats, um, it could be a good idea to start a study group, which is a great way to meet people and um, study at the same time, because um, it's really effective to kind of test each other. Most likely you'll find that if you're in a group of five, everyone will have um, one part of the lecture, one part of the tutorial that you maybe missed. So you can pick up on each other's strengths and weaknesses and uh, kind of form a bond at the same time. I think going off of what Sarah said about not being afraid to reach out, um, you do never know who could be on the other side of that message. And I think it can be super scary of like, oh, who knows like what could happen, but also who knows what could happen if that makes sense. Um, that could be your best friend on the other side of that message. And at the end of the day, you don't really have anything to lose. Um, and I think that's something that's would be super unique this year and super beneficial is that like we have nothing to lose. So it's always good to reach out because um, you never know what could happen. I think to add on to what Ganit said is also with study groups, um, I think it brings a lot of like accountability. Like I usually like to study in groups just because we'll like put deadlines for each other to like finish things earlier. Um, and that usually helps me with like my studying and make sure that I'm not like procrastinating till the last minute. Um, and you could definitely use online platforms like Zoom, et cetera, to just like meet with people. Uh, but you can also use those platforms to do fun games. There's like a bunch of new like online games um, that have come into like light because of like recent events or you can watch like a Netflix party or things like that. So there's definitely um, a lot of different ways that you can do like outside of studying, like you can actually um, have hobbies to do with other people. It might just look a little different. Um, and then hopefully you'll be able to meet them in the winter semester. Anyone else have any thoughts, ideas? If not, we can move on. So our next topic is time management. So of course, the transition from high school to university is going to be really difficult. You'll notice that your workload starts to change and you have other responsibilities starting to come up. So time management is going to be a huge skill that you want to learn. Um, and so for this skill, we'll have Bela answer this question. Um, so yeah, I think like Anit mentioned, time management was a super scary 
thing for me in first year. I'd gone from having like a pretty structured schedule all throughout high, throughout high school um, and then coming to university, I found a lot more freedom. And on one side, that's great because you get to tailor your schedule a little bit to your needs. Um, and pick it a little bit more, but also it meant I had a lot more freedom and I had to be stricter with myself in terms of um, deadlines and things like that. So a few things that have helped me a lot. Um, at the beginning of the semester, all your profs will give you a syllabus and it basically breaks down the content for the course and what you'll cover in the course. Um, any important information that you should know about like textbooks or anything like that. It'll also have deadlines um, for any tests or assignments or things like that. The first thing I do when I get my syllabus is like bring out my calendar and put them all in my calendar. Um, I use Google Calendar. I really like it. Um, I've tried a different, couple different things, but Google Calendar is just the one that I really like. Um, so yeah, that helps me stay on track a little bit in terms of deadlines and I can see them when they're coming up. Um, another thing that really helps me is taking breaks. Um, I think it's easy and it especially will be easy this year to like keep pushing even if you're saying, oh, 15 more minutes and then I'll take a break um, when you might not be focused great in the first place and you might need a break and taking breaks is okay. So then it'll help you focus more um, when you do need to get working and then it'll work more effectively and efficiently in the long run. Um, another thing that I think I've, it's taken me until fourth year to learn is being honest with what I think I can do each day. So I think it's really easy to write a to-do list of a million and one things. Be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get this done all day. Um, and then you don't get all those things done and then you don't feel super great about it afterwards. So I think being honest at the beginning with what I think I can get done each day um, has been super helpful because then you'll feel better if you get those things done and then if you do get those things done you can like start a little bit on tomorrow um, or just take a break and accept that that's great that you got all those things done. Um, I know there's different like calendars things like that. Does anybody else like any of the other panelists or Ganit or Sophia um, or anyone have any things that have helped them manage their time? Um, I would just say, again, off of the point of being like realistic on what you can do each day, you'll notice, especially um, in first year, that you'll get a lot of uh, courses that they'll assign you multiple readings and multiple uh, questions for each chapter of that reading. Um, and it'll start to pile up pretty quickly as the pace starts to uh, pick up during the semester. So taking a step back and looking at how much time you have in the day and how much of those questions you can actually get done is really important. Because I know like speaking from personal experience, and I know a lot of us on the panel can probably agree with that or relate to this, um, is that for some courses, you'll get assigned like 30 questions. Um, but realistically, those are just practice questions. So whether you do five of those and you feel comfortable, that's totally fine. Or if you have time to do all 30, that's also okay. It's going to be different for everyone depending on what your schedule is and um, whether that's your strength or weakness. So recognizing that and um, planning your time accordingly is very important. To add on to that, I would also recommend, like, for example, if you do um, have so many different things to do for a course, like chemistry, for example, where you have tutorial questions, readings, um, textbook questions, sometimes it's also really helpful to ask your prof or your TA and ask them what do they think you should prioritize? Because realistically, you're juggling and managing so many different things. Um, and I remember I went to office hours one time and my professor was like, oh, like, no, don't worry about those questions or, you know what? focus your attention here. So that can also really help you with managing your time. Um, and again, when I came into university, I came with the mindset that like, no, like if my prof assigns this to me, like I have to do it. Um, but that's not the case. You have to do what's best for you. Um, and also just to build off of Bela's point on Google Calendar, I did not learn about it until I think second year and it truly changed my life. So I would definitely recommend looking into it. You can color code all your courses, move it around. Um, so I definitely found that very helpful. So definitely check that out. And I think also a plug, another plug to Google Calendar is you can actually put your class schedule on there as well so that when you're planning the rest of your day out, you don't have to like take the time to add in your courses, it'll add the whole semester's worth of stuff right on there. Mm -hmm. awesome. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you... I was just going to say to build off of the Google Calendar point is um, I find it super helpful to like schedule literally everything I do in there. So um, whether that's, you know, doing, having an online call with my friends, um, a doctor's appointment, um, a project meeting, whatever it is, just so that everything I need is in one space so that I'm not constantly frantically searching every like social media platform to try to see like what I have to do next. So having it one space and having it available on multiple devices is super helpful. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, um, going back to, I think, Amit, you mentioned it about, like, the textbook questions. I think it goes the same for readings, and something I struggled with was, like, feeling like I had to do every single reading and every, like, take notes on every single reading. Um, that is not the case, and that will be a large amount of time that you spend doing that, and most times, or sometimes, it's not, like, you don't need to know that extent of the reading. Um, so one of my recommendations that's really helped me is being honest and asking your prof at the beginning of each course or a TA um, to what detail you need to understand the readings or like how much of the test material will come from the readings like that. Because um, sometimes it's really heavily based on the readings and sometimes it's just like general knowledge and it's used as a resource um, in case like you don't understand a concept that's brought up in lecture. Um, so that's something that I've used that's really saved time for me. <laughs> Um, I just had something to add about uh, managing your time and resources that you would have available to you. So a lot of the different uh, faculty societies that are run by students offer review sessions. So whenever you have a midterm or an exam, usually like maybe a week before they would have a review session. So what I would do with my friends is we would all study as if the exam was that like week earlier so that we'd come to that review session prepared and it offered a lot of good practice and focused on the things that upper years had seen come up on tests. So that was really helpful. So in addition to your profs and your TAs, another great resource are upper year students who've taken that course um, in the past. Um, I think there's something I wanted to mention was that um, kind of like time management is a process. Uh, so it doesn't really mean that you'll get the hang of it within the first week. Like I don't think I really understood how to manage my time until like second year. Um, so just like allow yourself to kind of like learn as you go through it um, because I mean I feel like the adjustment from high school to university can be kind of difficult um, so and having all these five courses being online um, so like definitely um, and it was Nagar, could you repeat what you said? We didn't catch the last part. Oh, sorry, did I like cut off? I just said that time management could just look different for different people. So um, just like allow yourself to learn about that. Like some people really like to stay awake at night. Um, some people are really morning people, you know, like there's only so much people can focus. Some people like to study alone or in groups. Um, so there's definitely a lot of chances for you to learn about yourself um, and then adapt accordingly. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on, I know a lot of people use Google ca Calendar. I use Apple Calendar. It works just as well. I think um, an advantage of Google Calendar is that like from my timetable, you can specifically download like your course schedule versus with Apple, you have to kind of just like make it yourself. But it honestly, like I think is worth the time. Um, so just depending on your preference, like both work great. I can also attest to that. I also use Apple Calendar and it works. Now to touch on some other resources that you might find helpful. Um, so if you take end up taking first year psych, you'll most likely learn about this technique, which is the Pomodoro technique. So essentially what this is, is you focus, um, whether you're doing studying or finishing up an assignment for 25 minutes, and then you have five minutes off. So whatever, if you're going uh, on social media, taking a break, eating a snack, whatever it is. And for the length of time that you wanna do work, you'll just essentially repeat this process. So 25 on, five off, 25 on, five off, um, for however long that you wanna do this. And this has been proven to increase uh, your focus um, for the tasks that you're doing. So it's an easy way to keep yourself um, accountable, making sure that your breaks um, don't suddenly stretch to being an hour or two hours longer, you end up taking a nap. Um, so I personally found this really helpful um, during the midterm um, and exam time. Um, I think when I'm just doing assignments, it's a little bit uh, easier to kind of shift focus between different um, tasks, but specifically for studying for tests, I think this technique is super useful. Um, and you can also download uh, this app, which is called Pomo done app directly onto your computer or your phone, um, or you could just time it yourself, whatever you prefer. Um, so that's uh, super simple. Um, and then another tip is to make a specific music playlist, whether on Apple Music or Spotify, um, 
that's tailored to your taste for studying. Um, it kind of just helps you get into the headspace and mindset of studying. Um, you can add songs, share it with your friends so that you're kind of listening to the same songs. Um, I, find, I find this really helpful, or you can also just listen to um, nature sounds or instrumental music if you find it a little bit harder to focus uh, with words. Um, and the last tip is, uh, if you look up one of the services that's offered here at McMaster, which is the Student Success Center, uh, we'll also be having them as a guest on a webinar later on. Um, but I just quickly want to mention that they have this great tip sheet, which is called the 101 Time Management Tips. And there's literally 101 tips on how to manage time, um, which I think is super helpful because obviously everyone has um, different preferences and experiences. So you'll find some of them work for you and some of them don't. So I think it'll be super helpful to go through that list, highlight the ones that you think would uh, work for you and try them out. So now we'll be moving on to the Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, so I just want to mention again that if you have any questions, you can directly uh, message them to Sophia. Um, she'll receive the question and then um, us as well as the panelists will answer it. All right, so we've been getting lots of questions, which is really exciting. Um, this one's directly related to what we just talked about um, in terms of review sessions for courses. So someone asked, will there be review sessions this coming school year, even though it's online? Sure, so I can speak to that. So I know a lot of different faculty societies and different clubs are deciding how they can still offer the same resources um, online. So Sessions such as this, like in a Zoom webinar, or maybe it'll be a Microsoft Teams meeting, um, some kind of online platform, those review sessions will still be offered. They'll just look a little bit different. Um, so if you're interested in those, um, whatever your faculty name is, just search for their page on uh, Facebook, and they usually post updates about what they'll be doing on there. Awesome. Um, along those lines as well, um, we have been getting a few questions that are essentially just saying like, are clubs still going to run online in the fall semester and how will I learn about the available ones? I can kind of speak to that. I know that they are planning like an online club fest, so usually... Nagar, no, you just cut out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'll just keep my video off. Um, am I cutting out still? No, you're good. Okay, um, so essentially what I was saying is that there will be like a virtual club fest. So usually there's a club fest that's hosted um, on the first and second day of school and all the clubs have like tables and you get to sign up. Um, and they're just working on making that kind of virtual now. So I think it's going to take a little bit of time to see how they're going to do that. Uh, but I know that most clubs, and at least I can speak for MSU services, will be running. Um, they will just be functioning differently at a different capacity, but they're still trying their best to offer the same resources to students. And I'm sure that the same is going to be with clubs. Um, so yeah, just I would say just keep an eye out for it. I'm sure more information is coming as the university kind of releases more information. Just to add a little bit of a plug, um, if you want to volunteer, but you can't go in person to schools, if you want to volunteer as a tutor, I know an organization called Frontier College that is recruiting uh, volunteers for a virtual literacy program. So you basically would work one on one with students through a platform like Zoom. And um, there are basically like community health centers in Hamilton, elementary schools, um, community centers that offer this program and students just sign up online. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can find them on Facebook at Frontier College Hamilton, I think is their uh, name. So that's just an example of something that you can do. So though the opportunities might seem scarce because you're online, um, I think just taking the initiative to search for things, especially on Facebook is a good place to start, um, is a good way to try to get involved. Um, and on that topic, I would just like to mention Facebook. I know, I feel like has kind of died down um, throughout the years, but I definitely want to mention that at Mac, it's like 
we're very Facebook heavy. So if you don't have a Facebook account yet, or if you're um, considering not 100% sure, I would definitely recommend looking into it. Um, we also have a lot of opportunity pages uh, with different faculties where people post opportunities to get involved in different clubs um, or different volunteer opportunities. So having Facebook uh, really helps. Awesome, okay. So this one is a more enrollment specific question, um, but I think it can definitely apply to anyone who might be having issues with enrollment in terms of who they can contact. Um, so it says, my question for courses is that I'm planning to go into engineering with an addition of management. Management requires me to take a micro econ class for the, uh, in first year, but since I'm registered in the engineering program, how will they know that it's a prerequis prerequisite course for me? <laughs> Bela, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, I think probably emailing your faculty society, or sorry, your faculty office um, is probably the best way to start. Um, they are pretty understanding of the fact that students will often like need courses that might not be as obvious that they need them. Um, and they should be able to like open up some seats for you or something like that and help you out with it. I just had something to add on to that. Um, also, I think with some courses, even if you don't get in, you can usually email the prof if you have circumstances. For example, you do want to do a minor or there's something specific that you do need that is required for you. Um, you can reach out to the prof um, or the course coordinator and let them know of your situation. And they usually do make accommodations just because students who do enroll in it don't necessarily stay. A lot of people do drop the course. Um, so I would say just don't lose hope. There's definitely a lot of opportunity to change your courses and get into new courses. And just to add on to that about what a minor is. So if you have your major is, let's say, um, like business, but you want to do a minor in anthropology because that's something you're interested in. Um, basically, all that means is that you did a certain number of units that are related to that subject. Um, so for instance, I, for the past couple of years, I've been pursuing a minor in psychology, but my program is health sciences. So I need 24 units of psychology courses. I think right now I have less than that. So I don't know if I'm going to finish it next year. Um, but that's something that you can declare at your graduation if you'd like um, to have that minor. So that's basically how that works. Um, and I just wanted to add on in regards to course selection. Um, when that initially happens, you're probably going to get a little bit frustrated because you're going to see courses are open, but you can't enroll in it because they're reserved. Um, those blue squares still haunt me and they probably will continue, will continue to, but just know that um, if something's reserved, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't enroll into it later. Oftentimes, I think it'll probably look different this year, but maybe in July or later in August, um, those seats will also open up. So then you'll have a chance to enroll in those courses, but um, programs generally try to reserve seats so that students who need to take those courses can enroll in them. And um, I guess back to what Nagar was saying, truly keep trying, um, be persistent. I remember, I think on the second last day of like the ad drop date, I like finally got into the course that I wanted to. Um, so just keep trying, keep checking every day um, to see if the course that you want is open. Yeah, so definitely contact someone if you aren't able for some reason to enroll um, in a mandatory course for your program. So a similar question that we got is how would I actually know what the required courses are for my program or any upper year specializations, specifically life science for this question, but it can be a general statement too. Um, so for any of your programs, when you go into Mosaic, um, into the, the part, I wish there was a visual way to show you, um, but when you go into your area to add your courses, um, there's a section that sort of has like your required courses and it's like basically like a tab that opens up and like a list, it'll show you first year requirements that you, um, for example, if we're talking life style, it'll be like Chem 1A03, Chem 1A3, Bio 1A03, and so on and so forth. Um, and you'll know you have to pick those. Um, every program is different uh, from year to year. That'll sort of change depending on um, what program you end up going into um, in your upper years. But that's basically the process. I know it's kind of verbally, it's kind of hard to um, explain, but you'll hopefully see it when you go on the Mosaic website. Um, Thank you for um, my screen. Can you? Yeah, I can see your screen. Wait, I think so. 
Yes. Can everyone see it? Yeah, okay. Um, so I got a couple questions about how to enroll in classes. So just online um, at build-degree slash my timetable. And it tells you like a step-by-step -step in terms of like how to plan your schedule and then where to find your course details. So checking um, requirements and prereqs, going to the academic calendar to find that. Um, tips about blocking off time. So this is something that Sophia was talking about earlier. Um, pinning courses and favorites and how to actually enroll. And there's actually a video as well. So if you guys are interested, once the time comes, which is in July this year, um, you can go over to this website um, to learn more. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, Sophia, you can share your screen again. I was just gonna add on until well, Sophia is sharing her screen, um, is that with life sciences, there's a uh, second year specialization. So I think that that person was also asking about how you would know prerequisites for specializations, because for example, there's like psychology, neuroscience and behavior, there's like biochemistry, like all these different things that may require you to take certain courses. Um, so all you would really need to do is um, search up like biochemistry McMaster requirements on Google. And it's the first thing that will pop up and it will tell you uh, what courses you need to take. So for example, for biochemistry, you're required to take both of the chemistries um, and like both of the bios. But if you want to go into like psychology, neuroscience and behavior, then you don't have to take the chemistry. So I think it's definitely good to look into it, um, depending if you already have an idea of what you want to do for your second year specialization. Um, and I think this also applies to like other programs. Um, I know I didn't have any clue what I wanted to go into. I didn't know there were specializations to begin with. Uh, you have a ton of time until like the end of April to kind of figure out what specializations you want to go into and you will have program societies hosting, um, hopefully in person, but maybe even virtual, kind of talking about um, the different specializations that exist and how you can get in, what the entry like GPA is and all that stuff. So there's definitely a ton of time to learn about that. Uh, but if you are interested, um, you can just Google whatever program you want, McMaster University, um, and it will show up what the requirements are. I think, Hiba, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, so for life sciences specifically, there's a website called MAPSci. It's like MAP, M-A-P, and then SCI, S-C-I. Um, and that is also a really great resource if you want to like explore secondary specializations. Okay. Um, I think someone, sorry, I was just going to um, address a question of, um, I mentioned a little earlier about the Google calendars and how to sync them. I personally am a Apple calendar user. Um, so the fact that I mentioned that, how do you do it? I Googled it. Um, and you basically, when you log into Mosaic, there should be like a sort of like a box, correct me if I'm wrong, that you click on and that'll help you sync. Yes. Okay. So that'll just help you sync your Google calendar with your class schedule. We all learned stuff today, great. <laughs> all right, um, so the next question, which is like a super common one for first years, um, we wanna talk a little bit about tutorial courses. So like, what are they? How you enroll in them? Are they beneficial? What's the difference between that and the lecture? All that good stuff. I can kind of touch on this. So lectures, uh, essentially the larger portion of your course. So for example, I'm just going to use a course that's common for a bunch of first years, let's say chemistry. So you'll have four different cores. So that's the lecture that takes place at four different times, depending on whatever time you choose for you. Um, so there will be, for example, 300 to 400 people in that lecture. Of course, for smaller courses, you will have less people in it, but the larger the course, the more common it is, you'll have more people in it. Um, and then out of everyone that's taking that course, they'll be divided, in, divided into multiple tutorials. So for a course as large as chemistry, sometimes there can be 25 to 30 tutorials. And the tutorials will be a smaller classroom based setting so obviously it's different online but if we come back to campus in the winter um, it's essentially like a high school classroom so 25 to 30 students uh, with one TA and the TA is usually a undergrad or a graduate student um, who has who's in the program of that course um, and they kind of go through the problems with you if it's for chemistry you'll have a TA um, for your lab um, and that's the person that you go to to ask the majority of your questions because if you think about the number of people you have and 
if you have one professor, it's not realistic for everyone to go to the professor for help. So that's kind of your first point of contact um, is to talk to your student TA with uh, whatever help you need and then they can sometimes refer you to the prof if you need extra help. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to echo that your TAs are so important. Um, well, for one reason, because they have less students to focus on, but the second reason is that they provide you with extra resources that your prof may not. So for example, in my first year, I took an introductory to sociology class. And um, every before every midterm, our TA gave us a quiz and it was only like 10 or 15 questions. Um, but by engaging in that tutorial and doing those questions, some of those questions actually showed up on the exam. So it was really helpful to, um, if I was unclear about something, to ask my TA um, because it did help in the end. Cool, yeah, and just to add on to that, um, tutorials I think are super useful, especially like some of them will take attendance, so it'll count for marks for you to show up. Um, but if they don't, I would say just try out going to them. Um, it can definitely answer a lot of the questions you might have had during the lecture. And alongside that, when you're enrolling, I know something that confused me is the big lectures themselves with the professor will have like, uh, Ganit said, like four cores, for example, and it'll show the difference by saying C and then 01, 02, 03. So you'll have like C01, C02, C03. Those are the different cores. If you have tutorials, it's gonna be T. So it'll be T01, T02, et cetera. And then labs will usually have an L. So that's how you know the difference um, in terms of my timetable when you're scheduling them. And if you do have um, like tutorials for a course you're taking, you'll have to enroll in one. Um, yeah, and it's up to you if you go or not, I guess. Um, but yeah, I would recommend it. They're super useful. Awesome, okay. So we've also been getting so, so, so many questions about um, if we have any advice on taking notes in university, any software or note-taking devices we use, specifically if we recommend iPads, um, and just like keeping up with lecture material in general during the class. Um, I can kind of like talk a little bit about it. I um, I feel like it depends. Like for me, I took notes during class, but then I never looked at them again. So I feel like if you make an effort to like take good notes and then look at them after, um, it's really useful. I realized that like for me, what works best was trying to focus um, during the lecture and trying to understand it and then maybe going on my own time um, and kind of like, taking little notes or notes that would make sense I just felt like during class when the prof was speaking really fast I was just typing stuff up and half of them were just like spelling mistakes um so I feel like it, you can kind of like work around with it um but in terms of like an iPad I know a lot of my friends did have iPads that really helped them take notes um and I feel like in a virtual setting it could be useful if you had an iPad um to kind of like have on the side but I don't I also like writing my notes so I think it just kind of depends on how you are. I end up writing them all down anyway. Um, but yeah, I would say something that has really worked for me in the past like three years is trying my best to go into class and saying I'm gonna focus and try to understand and ask questions during it. And then um, take time after to maybe review and write like um, concise notes so that I'm not writing down everything. Um, to add on to that, I think something that's actually going to be kind of beneficial because we're online is I'm assuming there might be more recorded lectures, um, so lectures that you might have access to um, after they're done. And something that I like to do was watch those lectures at like two times the speed and then take my notes then. And then when I was in class, like Nagar said, kind of listening, absorbing all the information, um, that really worked for me. And I think I'd also say be okay with having different strategies for different courses. Um, for example, I also, I also used to be someone who loved to like write notes and I still do, but for some courses, for example, like anatomy, me, I figured that was just too much for me. So I started to use OneNote um, and that was really helpful. I had my um, slides on the side and then I would write my notes on the side. Um, but then for courses where I felt like it was a little bit more manageable to write things down, I would. So it's okay if you, um, you know, change your strategy for different courses. Um, I definitely recommend, you know, kind of um, sitting in the course, seeing how it is, and then taking a week or so to figure that out. 
something that I was going to bring up that um, I think has helped me is it's okay to like not know in first year how you're going to like take your notes. Um, I think it's taken me until third year to really like figure out what works for me. Um, something I do is I take like super messy notes in lecture. Um, I don't mean for them to come out messy, but that's just how they come out. Um, and then afterwards I sit and try and kind of piece it together. And then I take reading notes and add them to there. And then the week after that, once I've had like a little bit time to digest the material, I go through and I organize them and I like make them super neat um, and try and summarize a lot of stuff. So then by the time it comes to study for a midterm or an exam, I've already looked at that material like almost three times by now. Um, it's super time consuming, but I find it helps me in the long run. Um, and I don't have to end up actually cramming for tests and things like that. Um, but it's taken me until third year to figure that method out. Um, so don't feel like you have to know exactly like what works for you in first year either. Um, I think one thing that I've had to learn, um, and I learned this the hard way in first year is that sometimes um, the traditional sort of idea of taking notes, like writing it down or just typing it all on your laptop um, straight from just listening isn't maybe as helpful. I'm not great and as like a by through absorbing like auditory input so like visually having the slideshow on my screen and having to type next to it sort of helps me link information later on um, or using things like Quizlet or Anki or different resources that sort of help you create little cute cards online that can later like test you on little terminology or like little pieces of knowledge that might be like harder to grasp can be helpful um, as opposed to just reading through your notes later on. I just wanted to quickly echo uh, OneNote. Like OneNote is um, something I only found out about I think in second year and it's truly like life-changing um, because you can have all the slides up and like you can you can record if you want to like record the lecture if your prof allows you to it depends I think. Um, I think it will definitely look different kind of with everything being virtual. Uh, but wow, like, yeah, you can have all your slides and you can take your notes beside it. Um, and if you have an iPad, you can like mark stuff down. So I would definitely um, really recommend it. And you get access to OneNote and um, kind of like Office 360 just through being like a McMaster student. Um, so that comes to you for free. OneNote is the best. It's so good. So good. <laughs> so good. I just want to add uh, my like personal experience with writing notes just because um, I think everyone has different techniques and strategies that they use. So um, us sharing all of ours, you can probably find one that works for you. Um, so for me, I found that uh, downloading the PowerPoint that your prof will should or mo will most likely put up uh, before your lecture um, into OneNote and then going through the whole PowerPoint and um, like strategically highlighting so not highlighting everything like highlighting certain terms um, or subheadings and then writing what I know about that topic on the side um, so it's gonna be different for each course so for example for chemistry you might not know everything before you learn it um, but for example for uh, psych or bio if you have information from high school that you remember put those um, notes or what your understanding of that concept is on the side of the PowerPoint and then that way when I came to class I kind of already had a grasp of what I was gonna learn so that when the uh, when the lecturer started talking and they do tend to um, talk really fa fast uh, you kind of already know what they're gonna say um, and so it's a little bit easier to pick up on what they're saying and write it down and then after lecture I like right after after, when you have the information like fresh inside your mind, um, I would review uh, the PowerPoint and star concepts that uh, were a little bit harder to understand and then spend time reviewing those. And I think that if you kind of commit to doing that for most of your classes and um, reviewing after every lecture, you'll find that it's so much easier to review before a test or before exams. Um, just to add on, since a lot of the questions are about how to study so far, um, Sophia and Ganit will actually be hosting another webinar in a couple of weeks um, on how to study. So we'll have new uh, panelists to come in to share their thoughts on that as well. So make sure to tune in for that. The registration will work the same way as for this one. Yeah, and something I really quickly wanted to mention, um, there have been some questions about office hours. So by the time um, your courses go up on Avenue, which is basically like the website where you're going to have like your account and all your courses. 
your prof should post usually in the syllabus the times that they are free to offer office hours most of the time they're going to ask you to email before um, and I imagine that in the current climate, it's probably going to look more like a Zoom call. Traditionally, like you'd actually go into their office and chat with them. Um, but your prof will touch on that at the start of the course. So even usually the first lecture for every single course is just kind of like the prof talking about the course itself, not actually learning anything. Um, but that's when you're going to find out all that information and how to get in touch with them. They'll definitely still be available um, to talk to you, even though your courses are online. Yeah, for sure. I'm actually taking a physics class right now and we do have office hours that are each week. So the TAs offer their own office hours and they're during various times of the day. So if you're somebody who like, let's say um, you have other commitments and you're unable to come to the office hour, there's tons of options for you. And the prof also offers their own office hours as well. And even if you don't have your own questions, you can kind of just hop on and listen to other people's questions. I personally found that to be really helpful. Um, so yeah, there, there will definitely be um, virtual um, resources like that offered. I think just since we're on this topic, I'd like to mention that it's really important to go to office hours. I was really scared of them in first year. I did not go and I definitely regret it because I think your profs are definitely there to help you um, and they can help you navigate a lot of things. Um, and it could just be as quick as sending them an email and asking them one of the questions. Uh, but I realized in second year that going off that was really helped me. And like Jane mentioned, a lot of times I just went and then people asked kind of questions. I was like, wow, I did not know that. So it's a lot of like, you can also just drop by and have other people's questions be answered, but it will benefit you. Um, and you can kind of gauge how much you know or don't know. Um, but yeah, I would say just reach out to your profs and don't be scared. I know it can be a little intimidate, be a little bit intimidating, but they are there to help you. Um, and they usually do respond to their emails. So yeah. Awesome. Okay. So it is seven o'clock now. So I think something that we've also gotten a lot of questions about that would be nice to wrap up with is if you could give one piece of advice to your first year self, what would it be? Maybe we can all go around and do what you would, like what you wish you knew in first year advice. This is a really good question. It's going to take some self-reflection. So if anyone wants to go first, please do. I can go. Um, one thing I really learned the hard way was to ask for help. Um, I'm very used to just doing things on my own. So if you're somebody who's like that, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Ask upper years, your TAs, your profs, whoever really is willing to help you. Um, people at Mac are so nice um, and they're so open. And I realized this after struggling um, for quite a long time in my first year. So I would really, really suggest that you reach out and ask for help in, in anything. So it can be academic, non-academic, whatever the case may be. Um, I can go ahead. I think um, when advice I would give to my first year self is that, you know, like, it's okay if things don't go as planned. I think um, a lot of times you come into with a mindset of what you want exactly out of your first year, um, or like what specialization you hope you get into. And sometimes just like things don't work out. Um, and I think later in, like, you'll realize why things worked out the way they did. But it's also just okay if things, you know, like failure is okay. And I think that's like a big thing that I realized. Um, in my first year, I just remember like studying for my first chem midterm and being like, wow, like I'm so ready and like ended up getting like a 60 on it. Um, but that did not determine the end mark that I ended up with. So I think it's a lot about um, realizing that you are adjusting and it's okay to like, you know, have little failures along the way. Uh, but that doesn't determine your overall success at university or even in first year. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Nagar said about chem. Um, the profs really do understand, especially in first year, that it might be a transition for you in terms of academics. So they do offer um, different grading schemes where they'll make your first midterm worth 0% if you do better on your next ones. So then it all work out in the end. You kind of have that time to like transition easily. Um, so yeah, um, good point on that. I think my advice would be, um, to be comfortable, being uncomfortable, if that makes sense. So seeking opportunities that you might be scared of doing, but you think that it'll be really fun. So for example, like getting involved with Horizons and attending the conference for me was something that I was scared to do. Um, but then I went and met, made a lot of friends and um, was able to be involved for um, the next year. So um, 
kind of getting out of your comfort zone would be the, my main advice to my first year self. I think my biggest piece of advice was be okay not knowing everything. Um, I think something I struggled with in first year was like feeling like I had to know everything or like know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I'm in fourth year and I still have zero clue what I want to do after university. Um, and I think going along with that, being okay with change and that it's okay to like change your mind on things. I changed my program um, halfway through my second year. So I like ended up being behind on some courses. So I'm going to do a fifth year, but, like that's okay. Um, and it's okay to change your mind and just make sure that like, it's okay to not know what you want to do and don't be so hard on yourself in that aspect. I think something that I would um, tell myself is to be open to change um, and be very flexible. I feel like in high school, like some of my teachers, they had a very um, like, I guess kind of routine way of doing something or like teaching and like assigning homework. Um, I feel like in university, everything's different and with each course, it's so different. So allow yourself to explore, explore different strategies, um, get involved, put yourself out there um, and just be very, I guess, open to change, flexible and not kind of, um, force yourself to, I guess, continue to practice the same things that you did in high school, because some of some things might be the same and that's okay. And some things might have to change and that's okay too. I can go next. So I think one of the biggest pieces of, of, of advice I would give is to take care of yourself, which might seem really simple, but I think it's really important. Um, I think especially in first semester and first year, it's easy to get caught up with um, the change and the increased workload. And I would say um, kind of being strict with yourself of taking care of yourself, like setting a specific time to go to sleep and making sure that you're getting enough rest in the long term will be a great help because you'll notice that when you're feeling run down and super overworked, you're not gonna get as much done as you would like or as you would think. So prioritizing your um, wellness on equal amount um, to your um, academics um, is super important. Um, yeah, so for me, I think my biggest thing was in first year, or I guess in high school, I was very, very involved. Um, and I spent a lot of my time on like clubs and extracurriculars. And in first year, I just like applied to everything um, that I possibly could have that might have been interesting to me. And I pretty much got rejected from everything. Um, <laughs> but um, with that, I think it's important that to know that that'll happen and just to keep applying. Um, because honestly, that kind of stuff has just directed me into finding things that I actually am interested in. So yeah, definitely take that chance. Even with Horizons, I wasn't super sure if this is something I'd like to do. And I applied and here we are. I'm having a great time. Um, so yeah, I think just go for it and know that like if one opportunity doesn't work out, there's going to be like five more that are going to be posted on Facebook in the next week. So yeah, just definitely don't be encouraged. It can definitely take some time to kind of transition from high school to university. I think that's a great note to end on. So um, on this slide, on the next slide, you'll see um, our contact information. So if you do have any more questions that we weren't able to answer um, in this webinar, you can contact any one of us um, through our emails or Instagrams, whatever you prefer, um, with whatever questions you have. Um, and just to end off, we wanna thank you guys all for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we know that this was a long webinar, but we appreciate you all coming. Um, for more updates and um, our sessions and future webinars, you can follow us on the MSU uh, underscore horizons account on Instagram. Um, and after this webinar, we will be posting the recording so that if you wanna look back on it, uh, you can have the option to do so, as well as a slide so that any information you might have missed during the webinar, you can also um, access that. Um, and just a reminder that our next webinar will be a week from now, so on June 17th at the same time, so 6 p.m. And the theme of that uh, webinar will be student life. So um, if you're interested in that, please tune in. And again, as Jane mentioned, the registration for that webinar will be the same um, process as you experienced for this webinar. Yeah, and I just wanted to reiterate, there were so, so many questions that y'all asked, so we couldn't get through everything, sadly. Um, but if you have any questions at all, like all of us would be more than happy to answer them. You can contact us through any like of the platforms that we've listed here um, and we can chat.
and yeah definitely come out to our next few webinars because they'll also be super informative i was going to say if folks want to take like a, a screenshot of the stage you're more than welcome to go ahead and do so this will be posted it might just take a day or so uh, for us to get everything up uh, but if you want to take a screenshot of it and message us you're more than welcome to I also just wanted to kind of end by uh, thanking McMaster alumni. They um, sponsored this webinar um, and you will kind of see in the coming weeks, we'll have a little contest and giveaway, giveaways. So make sure to tune in to our uh, webinars and you know, uh, keep an eye on up. So that is the end of our webinar. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, you're welcome to exit the webinar now. Um, and again, a follow up with us if you need to through our contact information. Yeah, I will be ending the meeting. Again, thank you all for joining and we hope to see